is uh, on open fracture management, and I'll just ask our panelists to make your way down. So we have um, the illustrious Christopher Haydell, Temple University Hospital. He is orthopedic trauma surgeon here. We have uh, Mitesh Shah from Drexel and uh, Hahnemann down the street. And uh, he's an orthopedic surgeon, uh, I guess representing the other end of Broad Street. We have Dr. Michael Bossi, he's a professor of orthopedic surgeon at uh, Carolina's, Center, uh, Carolina's Medical Center. He's actually gonna be giving a, uh, a lecture to you um, at the end of this uh, uh, early morning session uh, on a related topic, uh, but we'll certainly have him get into this session with us as well. And I think open fractures is um, you know, something we all uh, end up having to, having to deal with, and uh, there are some, some, I guess, general principles, but maybe some uh, concepts that uh, are worth discussing. Um, these are my disclosures. So I was hoping we can allow you to get familiar with um, maybe some of the more current literature regarding surgical timing, antibiotic choice and timing, uh, understand how to prioritize um, multiple issues with patients who have open fractures, and understand which factors like age, anatomic location, severity of injuries might alter or change your management approach. So, so I'll start off with a case. So a uh, 26-year-old male, multiple gunshot injuries. Um, he has uh, type 3B open tib fib fracture. Um, type 3A open mid-shaft femur fracture, and um, so on his exam, he does have some degree of vascular injury in this leg, although not requiring repair. So <clears throat> here are some of the clinical images. Okay, so initial thoughts, uh, Dr. Shaw? Yeah, I mean, this is obviously a, a vi one of those visually impressive injuries for sure. Um, I think, you know, it, your, your immediate uh, care is always going to be IV antibiotics um, in the uh, emergency room, tetanus, and then it's going to need some sort of formal debridement, aggressive debridement in the uh, operating room, followed by uh, some sort of stabilization, you know, temporary or uh, in order to bridge to your definitive fixation. Dr. Bossi, what what is uh, what do you think that is? I'm not I'm not, I don't know I actually don't know I'm asking because <laughs> that doesn't look like the normal a, bullets we see. It looks to me it looks, I, like a, I, looks like a jack and a rifle round. Like a rifle <laughs> round? That's what I would guess as well. Because so, it looks like a, a high uh, high, uh, high higher power injury than a typical handgun one. The wounds certainly do. And then when I saw this, my assumption are, are you guys hearing him in the, okay in the back? The mic sounds like it was not. Yes? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw that. And, you know, I got to say, you know, we had some discussion about gunshot fractures yesterday. And, um, you know, we're in North Philadelphia. We, we, we unfortunately see a lot of these. But I guess, um, you know, I, I never try to make an interpretation or dictate something that I think, you know, oh, I, I see this bullet and I think it may be this. Uh, I, sometimes just I really don't know. But... Um, I would certainly be uh, having communications amongst ourselves, like, wait a second, this is not a small bullet hole, and I see something that looks like a rifle. Regardless of what this looks like, I mean, I think you have this. <laughs> but I think this explains it. Would you, would you all agree? Yeah. Yep. So hospital day zero, patient undergoes debridement, um, placement of antibiotic beads, um, external fixation. I think the external fixation is actually not crossing the knee. Uh, I think it's actually two um, external fixators. Um, I'll stop, I'll, maybe I'll pause there. Um, Dr. Haydell, would you have managed this differently or any concerns here, issues? Uh, no, I mean, I looked at the films. The femur fracture looks fairly simple, uh, but it looks like you have a segmental defect in the tibia and some antibiotic beads in there. By the way, this here, there was, I don't know if you saw on the initial slide, um, it's kind of down to one artery. I think um, something, they had to get controlled. Right. Something was ligated <laughs> oh, here. Um, so 
So maybe maybe the, the vascular injury pushed them towards uh, damage control orthopedics and just getting the wound cleaned up. Um, whether, you know, the, the, the patient was shot, he might have some thoracic or abdo abdominal injuries that, that may prevent definitive fixation of the femur at this time. So I agree with the treatment plan at this point. Get things cleaned up, provisional fixation, and resuscitate. So a question or statement on the vascular injury. So is, you know, what I, what I did test in the morning was when I come in and the residents present a case and they say it's an injury like this, and they say it's doppelable pulses or the ABIs are depressed, you know, or whatever, and I said, what's the, what's, what, did the vascular, what did the vascular surgeon say? And they said, well, they've got blood flow. We didn't get a vascular consult. And the bottom line is, um, you know, what I stress is that I don't know whether this patient got a vascular consult or not, but I'm arguing that they should all have a vascular consult. Because we're not vascular surgeons, and if the if the leg goes ischemic at 24 or 36 or 48 hours, you know it's you who made the decision not to get the vascular assessment and had the vascular surgeons own up and say, yeah, we can either reconstruct this or we can't, or it's a leg at risk and it may die, right? But I think if you don't get the vascular consult on somebody who has a diminished ABI, then you're essentially accepting your responsibility for whatever happens to that extremity in the future. So I always get a vascular consult. I, yeah, I'm not exactly sure in this case how that was handled. What, I wonder maybe if you all shift the mics down, just slide them, slide them down one. That first yeah. one doesn't seem to be working too great. So, um, all right, so yeah, I don't know if that was the case here, but uh, we are a little bit concerned um, about uh, how well he's gonna perfuse. Um, anyway, hospital day two, um, I guess we didn't like, uh, necessarily how the uh, leg lined up. So a little bit of an external fixator ad adjustment, uh, partial wound closure, antibiotic beads, uh, vac change. How do you, um, how do you guys manage this? Um, you, so when you use antibiotic beads, do you always use a pouch? Do you ever put a vac on top of it and then just suck out all the antibiotics with the vac? Or do you feel like it's nicely contained so you use the vac? It's a little bit counterintuitive, but any thoughts on the panel about putting beads in a defect but then sucking out, out everything with the vac? I mean, I, I, I don't think there's a problem with putting a vac on antibiotic beads. Plus, if you just use a pouch, you know, fluid tends to accumulate in that wound and um, it just gets really soupy to kind of manage that. And I think the vac does a good job of cleaning that up. Um, and I think also the you know the if you use a, a silver sponge that kind of wards off the gram positive bacteria a little bit, <clears throat> but that's my personal preference. I don't know of any lit. You're probably going to pull out a paper that talks about this. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I mean not that I have. No. Any other thoughts? So you, everybody okay with beads, and then putting a vac on top of the beads? Yeah, definitely. Okay. All right, so, um, so that's done, and um, patient um, still has an open wound, has to get this done again. Uh, so um, what do you, th now, I know we don't have any plastic surgeons on the panel, but I mean, what are your you know, concerns now regarding coverage um, in terms of timing now? We're now at hospital day five. What do you think, Dr. Bossy? Well, I think you have a segmental uh, bone defect and a segmental, you know, uh, uh, a soft a tissue defect that uh, can be addressed, um, you know, at the same time or, or can be addressed uh, as a stage procedure. If you're facile with a ring fixator, you could put a fixator on and shorten this and probably close the wound and then, you know, um, ex uh, ex um, get limb length later. Uh, I think if you want to fix this with a, a nail device, then obviously um, you need coverage and uh, you need a plastic surgeon to, to get some tissue over that. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think this is, uh, I, th I would say, well, maybe I'll, I'll get a little further along and then uh, I'll kind of bring this back to some of the stuff Dr. Reed was talking about yesterday. So the patient gets the uh, femur finally fixed because remember there was also a femur fracture uh, this patient, by the way, actually had a gunshot femur fracture on the other side several years ago um, that we had also treated um, and actually had gotten an infection. Um, 
uh, which is a little unusual based on what we talked discuss, uh, discussed yesterday. But nevertheless, a little bit of a side note. But um, so the right leg still not definitively managed. So. But we're getting there, and we have classics involved, and we have not done a ring fix it. Or so, why don't you pull out your audience response? This, this, there's a lot of stuff on here, so I'll kind of slowly read through it before we start our timer. But what would you do to plant to fix this uh, tibia fracture definitively, or to address it? Ring fix or flap coverage, set up for bone transport, X fix, wound closure, skin graft, and then eventual lengthening. Uh, masculate technique, <clears throat> which is when you use like an antibiotic spacer, flap coverage with a nail, and then come back to bone graft. Um, would you just lengthen, uh, use a lengthening IM nail, one of the newer devices, uh, rather than a um, ring fixator, or do you just bone graft it and just go for it? So let's get our timer. And I know it makes it hard, you know, when I don't just put up one or two things, I put up these five things, there's a lot to think about, but I mean, these injuries, you have to get a little creative, right? I mean, there are a lot of potential solutions. I think you saw some solutions yesterday for how to manage this. Um, Dr. Shaw, what do you think about the responses here? Yeah, you know, um, I, it's funny because you were saying that there's, with five different options up there, uh, it's a little bit more to think about, but I think these speak to exactly what, you know, number three, I agree with. 45% of these people, that's probably in my hands what I would choose to do. I feel comfortable with, you know, nailing that. Um, most literature says that we should try to get to these relatively quickly. You know, we're starting to see closer to trying to get to it within a week, you know, if we can. Um, also, some literature coming out saying that masculine technique maybe isn't as good as we think it is. But So, I, I mean, Dr. Hand. Reed yesterday, I thought he said in the distal tibia, when you have bone loss, don't anybody tell me that, you know, masculine is going to be better than an Elizarov, yeah. hands down, and it's elegant, it's going to, it's, yeah, so right. he kind of was like, proximal tibia, I'll give it to you, mid shaft maybe, distal tibia, right, didn't he, I thought he sold you guys on ring fixators and you all picked 45% masculine, <laughs> so I won't tell him that, um, but Dr. Hadell, Dr. Bossy, you, 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 what do you all think? <clears throat> well, I think it, it depends on what your skill set is. If you, or if you're a nailer, you're going to nail this and, and put a, do a mescalite technique. If you're somebody who likes to put on ring fixators, you know you you die for a case like this because you can tinker with it for the next six months. Um, I prefer not to do that, so I put a nail in this and put a, a, a cement block in and get a flap flap on it, then come back and bone graft it later. All right. Well, sounds like sounds like what I was thinking. Um, <laughs> So removal of XFX, IM nail, antibiotic spacer, placement, free flap coverage. Um, Dr. Heddell, what do you think about the timing of the free flap coverage here? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's a bit delayed. Maybe we should have gotten that done in seven to 10 days, I guess. But, um, you know, if the wound bed wasn't ready or, you know, you, you said something earlier about being down to one vessel, you know, that, that can <coughs> kind of throw a wrench and get in flap coverage, you know, we're, we're at the cusp of, we're, we're mid shaft there, but you may consider a rotational flap at that level, but we're getting towards the distal tibia, so free flap may, may yeah, be necessary, I, or the, the tissue in the back may be torn up, so. Yeah, I can't remember now where they plugged in um, yeah. for this guy with his one vessel to get, free, but this is a free tissue transfer. Well, actually, the flash surgeon's really happy then because they've got two vessels they can use that aren't doing anything, and they just go proximal, proximal and find yeah. out what they, they have. I'm yeah. sure they had to, you know, the zone of injury, I guess, was mostly, you know, in here, so they were probably able to plug in a little bit higher, as you said, with a vessel that was thrombosed and ready to be used. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, what do you think about timing of the bone grafting? So, Dr. Shaw, you said, you know, you definitely like this idea of this technique. When are you trying to get him back? So you did your spacer, you did your free flap, and at your center, when do you try and when is the reality of getting these patients back for that, for that removal of the <coughs> spacer and bone grafting? Yeah, I mean, it, work? It, it's, uh, I, think, I think eight weeks is not an unreasonable time. I think it's also a conversation that you have to have with your plastics coverage, too to figure out when's a good time when they're feeling comfortable with their flap and 
can take any elevation that you're gonna do um, or along with them to get down to your spacer. So I, I try to wait at least six weeks, um, try to get a, some sort of reasonable uh, casing around your cement to I mean from the ortho standpoint why do we wait at all I mean I think we're waiting to just make sure the the wound doesn't declare itself as being infected right I mean in my mind but I find the plastic <coughs> surgeon they're looking at it differently any thoughts you're about to say something Dr. well I, th I think we if you're going to use a mescalite technique we wait for the membrane because the membrane is bioactive that's right that's um, true. and then you know and if you go in there and you actually scrape off some of the surface membrane there's actually in a lot of these cases there's new you know there's woven bone uh, beneath that that's already starting to form some some uh, some uh, some callus type bone around the the uh, implant how long does that membrane take to form I think you know you're you're safe in six weeks and it's active. I guess the at most activity from what I've read is between you know eight to sixteen weeks, and then after that, it maybe becomes a little more inert, um, and you may have to you know curetting uh, it or scraping it or doing whatever when you when you take the cement out. Um, you try to warn the residents when they take when they open this up to leave the membrane because you know they get real aggressive and take the membrane out. Well, that's where we did the mescalate technique. You know, it's not a debris bomb tissue. I want that tissue. You know, I guess what I see is that um, I'm usually ready to bone graft them a little bit earlier, and I think if it's up to the plastic surgeons, <coughs> what I've seen is they just want to wait as long as possible. So it's usually like, how long can we wait? Um, and I'm like, well, how soon can we do it? Um, and um, so I never seem to get these too much earlier than eight weeks. And, you know, I, I don't want a flap to fall apart, die, get infected, get an edge necrosis. So I trust my plastic surgery colleagues. If they're telling me, like, whoa, hold on, let's just give this a couple more weeks, sometimes these get pushed out before we get that bone grafting done. Um, I don't have the best follow-up on him. He did follow up with my plastic surgery colleague a little bit um, further along than I did. Super nice guy, as compliant as, as anybody, uh, as far as I could tell, but just would like disappear um, for, for months. Um, I did just snap a picture of him in my clinic uh, there on the left. This was a uh, anterolateral thigh flap, um, and um, that's, uh, that's him at least I want to say two months out. Uh, he did go on to some flap thinning procedures. I had spoken to him on the phone, although I kind of lost contact with him, and my plastic surgery colleague said functionally he's doing great. So I believe he's consolidating. Um, but, you know, we've had him here for a couple of separate traumas, so hopefully, hopefully we don't see him again. That's kind of what I'm hoping. <laughs> hopefully he's just doing fine out there. Any, uh, any other thoughts? I thought some of the take-home points from this case which we kind of said yesterday is that, you know, sometimes you hear gunshot injury, you actually need a debridement. I don't, I mean, nobody's gonna look at that wound with shards of bone sticking out the leg and think like, okay, oh, it's a gunshot injury. Um, why can't you send it out? Um, uh, so clearly some gunshot injuries require urgent debridement. Um, manage the dead space. I mean, in, uh, I think for most of us, antibiotic beads are easy to make. Uh, they elute tons of antibiotics. We saw some uh, resident presentations yesterday where they showed how we can maybe do better with antibiotic beads and spacers, but I think the idea of having these voids and filling the void, uh, I think, is, a, is an important concept with uh, bone loss, open fractures. And I think you saw how there's all these different options, right? So know some good options, at least know what the options are. What if the patient needed a free fibula and you really at least recognize that that is the sort of patient who's going to best benefit from it. If you at least know that, you might be able to at least send the patient to someone who does it, even if you don't, you know, you don't do that. Um, any other last thoughts about this case from the panel? Yeah, I think one of the more interesting um, uh, data points that's evolving is the antibiotic usage <laughs> and the, the bio burden of these wounds. We typically give the patients, if you uh, survey most hospitals, you know, they get a cephalosporin and maybe, you know, a genomycin of the first night. And then by, you know, your hospital SQIP things, when they go back to the OR, they'll get, uh, or they'll skip uh, uh, protocols, they'll get a uh, gram of cephalosporin, you know, pre-op and then uh, something in the first 24 hours, and they usually get that for, you know, wh whatever amount of time. Um, we just finished a study of 600 open fracture patients in the metric group, and we, we wanted to look at to see what the modern bio burden is and how you can't modulate something unless you know what it is. 
And we found out that in during hospitalization, that the patients, uh, interesting enough, had about uh, seven different courses of antibiotics if they were on the trauma service um, in five different categories. So they're getting, you know, combinations. The ENT guy's giving them antibiotics. The GI guy's getting, everybody's giving them antibiotics and nobody's paying attention. There's no, there's no stewardship in most, most centers, even though we think there is. And it turned out that at the, at the bacteria that was recovered from the wounds at the time of closure, so when the flap went down or the delay prime of closure was done, we cultured the wounds for both PCR and for, uh, for um, microbiology. And believe it or not, that there wasn't much staff there because we're given cephalosporins and staff is, is, uh, is, is, is beat down. But uh, the two organisms that were there in a high number were the enterococcus and enterobacter, which isn't covered by cephalosporin. So we followed the patients out to their, their next event, which was either a bone graft procedure or an infection. And we captured the tissues then. And cephal the staff came back to about 30%. But 30% of the bacteria recovered were enterococcus and 30% were, were uh, enterobacter. So the thought is that we have to do something at the time of closure to, to at least expect what the bioburden is and then address the bacteria that's really given us a long-term problem, which isn't staph. It's, uh, it's bacteria that isn't responsive to cephalosporin. So we may have to change our entire paradigm for treating open fractures that have to stay open for a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna, actually, was that, was that the bioburn study? Yep. Yeah, we did, we did um, contribute a few patients to, uh, to that series. The, um, that got a lot of patients. Uh, so not published yet, hopefully within, within the next year, but the data is really compelling. Yeah, and you know, I, um, it's, um, I just realized, you know, I have a summer student project who's gonna help, uh, a student resident's gonna help uh, revise our antibiotic fracture protocol, which is very, our, open fracture management protocol, which is very antibiotic choice driven and antibiotic duration driven to help drive our order sets of when a patient comes in with an open fracture, what should they get? Um, so it sounds like I might need to re revise it again in another year. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, antibiotics, we talked a lot about, you know, debridement and all these surgical options. Um, you know, I think that, um, uh, Firstly, immediate antibiotic prophylaxis um, is really important. I think one of the, uh, so actually Dr. Box, this is your paper. Um, so, t you know, we've said this again yesterday, time to debridement doesn't seem to be that associated with infection. So for instance, in our open fracture protocol, I actually don't have a time listed on there uh, to say like the fracture has to get to debridement by this time. We do have stuff about the antibiotics, timing and choice. Um, did I represent the uh, summary of your paper accurately, or is there something you want to point out? No, that's, that's pretty good. So one of the things that uh, we found, and I'll just, um, uh, you probably don't know about this paper because it's in the uh, PLOS One journal, but um, we found that this, is, this was almost a, um, uh, you could say a performance improvement type thing, because what we found is that Patients can answer very quickly, but when you use GENT, it's weight-based, and uh, p the practical problems, and we talk to people at other hospitals of administering a weight-based medication in the ER is that, you know, it's not often stocked right there. Someone, you know, it's not like a bag somebody can grab and just give. And what we found is that when you have to add GENT, there are huge delays, uh, no matter how much you keep educating everybody. So this is one thing we may change here um, if we can't mechanically just get the patients the, the gent doses because of the extra steps needed. Um, so just some food for thought. I mean, I think what we see here at our level one trauma center is probably not totally different. I'm sure a lot of other places probably have this issue. They may not realize it. Um, and I think on a separate note, um, I think that um, uh, if we think about other complications other than infection, we also worry about non-union, right? So with open fractures, what are the risks for non-union? This is a relatively recent paper in the journal Orthopedic Trauma uh, looking at risk factors for non-union. So as you know, uh, an infection itself, huge risk for non-union, right? So odds ratio of over 12. And then of course, this more severe open fractures. They actually found a slight uh, correlation with smoking that I guess Dr. Bossi's uh, study, um, at least with infection, uh, wasn't correlated, but they correlated with non-union. So I just want to ask the audience, get your clickers, 
And there are other choices here. This is kind of how I broke it down. How do you manage type 1 and 2 open fractures? So urgent IND, uh, operative IND in all cases, uh, operative debridement within 24 hours, uh, debridement of some type 1s, uh, but all of type 2s you know, within a reasonable time, or uh, just type 1s are not really open, um, and you just you know, you operated debridement of type 2s in a timely fashion. So if you had to pick one, what would you pick? So I have a countdown, Chris. Like I said, there, you may have an answer that doesn't fit, but uh, pick something. So let's see what you got. So a little bit of a spread. So it's, it doesn't seem like everybody wants to take everything immediately to the OR. Um, Dr. Haydel, what do you think? Um, I, I know this. the time to surgery seems to be a controversial topic. I think it's uh, location of fracture meaning body parts so I think upper extremity injuries especially type ones um, <clears throat> tend to be uh, delayed a little bit maybe within 24 hours um, with immediate fixation if necessary but I think in an open tibia fracture especially with gross contamination you're going to take that no matter what like immediately I think I think the tibia has a, a much higher propensity for infection than other areas of the body and deserves a, a little bit more uh, care, I guess, you know. And I always think about what I would want done to my leg, you know, even if it's a type 1 or type 2 and it's not dirty, I like it cleaned out as soon as possible, so. Other panelists see anything here that they want to point out they disagree with or <clears throat> anything? No, I, I think I'm probably, uh, maybe as I get older, I get you know, I'm more lazy or whatever, but at my, uh, my, at my center, I've got six partners. And um, we treat all the open fractures pretty much the same way. Uh, if it's a poke hole tibia, it's going to get fixed anyway, so we usually try to fix everything within 24 hours just to get them out of the hospital. So they go to the OR and we'll open it up and just wash it out. Uh, all of our cases get washed out in the emergency room by the, um, our, our, our on-call uh, resident team. Uh, because of the new T-quip issues, if you, for some reason a patient goes to the ICU and can't go to the OR and you haven't washed them out in 24 hours, you fail the, the, the level one trauma test. So we wash them out in the ER and then they, they dictate a, a, a debridement note. It was irrigating the breed and breed it in the uh, ER and then put in a splint and that, that covers it. Obviously not debris. <laughs> So um, we, don't bill, we, don't, we don't bill for it. We just do it as a, as a, a mechanism to you know, quality improvement. The, uh, the, unless the wound is absolutely filthy or dysvascular or compartment syndrome or whatever, uh, I don't think there's any difference in you know, one hour versus 24 hours, and there's no data that shows that. So we basically will stage the patient so we have the team available so we don't have somebody in the middle of the night who, who's not a trauma surgeon taking care of this. We have other people take call and uh, they'll just put it off to the morning when we make it the first case. Yeah, we, we generally take open fractures. You know, I would say, in, okay, so I think if you have a poke hole open fracture in the middle of the night, we don't mind pushing that off to the morning. We might actually do that at night. We, if it's a type two, we're usually doing it at night unless the patient, let's say, is really sick and can't go. Um, or there's a serious medical clearance issue, for instance. Um, I, I don't know, Chris, am I right? I think here yeah. we're, we mostly are taking open fractures, but we don't go nuts. Like Chris and I at Morning Report are not gonna like go ballistic if there's an open fracture that came in that didn't get done and there was like some good reason for it, especially. Um, yeah. I think patients who are in extremis and just can't go to the OR, you can't force it, you know, because it's not safe. But I think sometimes, you know, <clears throat> if there's a, there's also some other logistical issues that come into play, you know, if, um, you know, you got a full schedule and you have elective patients coming from the outside uh, in the morning and, and you have this open injury, now you're talking about a situation where yeah, just bump you either bump thing. your elective cases, which I think is the right thing to do because then if the patient just sits around all day and doesn't get debrided, it's probably not right. Um, you know, it can it throw a wrench in things. So also just, you know, being on call sometimes and being considerate of your colleagues and, and their schedules and stuff when taking the patients, you know, 
uh, situation into consideration. Do you guys have a trauma room? We do. We do have a trauma room. So sometimes it's just full. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, I think, so like our trauma room has last second release time, so we can do that. Uh, they're not gonna book into that room, but they also say, okay, well, that's your room. So, you know, if I have cases to put on for a day, that's the room I put them into. So I think every hospital is different. There was a time when we didn't really have much of a trauma room. And it's, or I, I've worked at places where the trauma room doesn't start till 1 p.m. maybe. So I think the concept of the trauma room is a little bit different. I talked to a colleague down the street who told me he doesn't even have a trauma room. Uh, and it's a level one trauma center. So I think <laughs> the textbook trauma room, I think, is um, is a great thing, but there, are, you know, that that's not necessarily. Uh, um, I guess it doesn't always work out perfectly. I guess sure. so. There, I, I agree with Chris. Mm -hmm. I think there are some logistical things, but you, you know, not having a trauma room is a huge problem because then you have no way to really um, manage that in a timely fashion. I think the flow study is worth mentioning here. Um, this was published in New England Journal a few years ago. Uh, data was also presented at the OTA meeting at the same time. Um, this was looking at, um, you know, there's been a lot of studies showing that soap may be better than normal saline and that low pressure irrigation may be safer than high pressure irrigation. So they did this randomized study in a two by two fashion and they actually found that uh, low and high pressure uh, had about the same rates of reoperation and that soap actually might have been problematic. So. I think if you go higher low pressure with saline, their study would suggest that's fine as part of the irrigation. Of course, as Dr. Harding made a big point yesterday, I mean, the debridement is probably more important than your irrigation, but it's still one of the things you do, and you know, we want to know what's the, what's the best uh, evidence there. So here's another case, 42-year-old male motorcycle versus truck, uh, open distal femur fracture. He's also got some other injuries. Um, and he's also, you know, he's, he's got some significant life-threatening life injuries as well here. Um, so, amongst all his injuries, patient has this open femur, open foot ankle injury, so gets the Breedmont procedure, spanning external fixator. Um, the elbow gets uh, IND and splinted. Um, maybe I'll just ask a question real quick. Um, Patient has an open olecranon fracture. With all this going on, um, Dr. Shaw, are you okay with IND and splinting that? Yeah. Can you X-fix the elbow? I, uh, I, I tend to try to avoid to X-fix the elbow if I can avoid it, um, unless you, know, you have an unstable elbow dislocation or something okay. like that. Okay. But uh, if, if the, the joint's concentric, then that's an IND and splint. I would, I would agree. So here's some of the injury films. You can see a lot going on. I'm um, not going to list through everything, but you can kind of just see a lot of open injuries there. Um, patient goes back, uh, repeat to breed months, gets the uh, elbow fixed. We've got antibiotic beads, and I'll start showing you some pictures. So patient gets the distal femur fixed, proximal tibia fixed, but there's this foot issue still going on. What are you, what are the panelists thinking, Dr. Bossy? Any concerns? Yeah, I'm concerned about the plantar surface and the heel pad. Uh, it looks uh, like that tissue is going to be dead. You're going to have uh, an exposed, uh, you know, inferior surface of the um, calcaneus and require most likely a, either a skin graft on friable tissue or a free tissue transfer to cover that. So this becomes, a, you know, a true limb salvage versus amputation question for me in a patient like this. So. Yeah, it looks yeah ugly. so yeah. that's what's going on here. So hospital day 12, 14, 16. Patient so I think that's evolving to a 3B. Excuse me? I think that's evolving to a 3B. Yeah. Okay, good point. Evolving to a 3B open injury indicating the, the need for uh, soft tissue coverage. Um, so here we are. So the, again, we, I'll, I'll go back. The patient's got this. Intraarticular distal femur that was fixed. Um, feel free to, to throw some stones at me. I, I, I treated this guy. Uh, <laughs> proximal tibia fracture, especially a four or five uh, plate we fixed. Um, but he's got this, um, I believe, let's just go back here. Um, open calcaneus fracture. 
um, ankle injury as well, and that's the, what the soft tissues look like. So, you know, what are the next steps? I mean, what do we do with, it with this guy now? He's like almost, he's getting on three weeks out now. He's in the hospital. We've been doing serial debridements. Uh, as you can imagine, that's an insensate foot, um, and um, he's got that. So, split thickness skin graft, ORIF, continue X fix, flap coverage, uh, ORIF, continue X fix. I know there's other choices here, but uh, I'll keep it simple. Blue knee amputation. So let's get a timer, Chris. So um, not a good situation, but we got to make a choice. We're kind of just sort of uh, kicking the can down the road a little bit here. Um, Dr. Haydel, what do you think? Split, pretty um, split here, as split as you can get, right? Yeah, Some people want to... You know, uh, at this point, it looks like the wound's pretty clean. Is there... Expo there's be definitely exposed bone there, I would um, probably say. Good question. I'm going to say not a lot okay? of exposed bone. No, I think it looks kind of beefy and like yeah. uh, not <clears throat> particularly infected, but... I mean, I think I think the challenge, even if you can get a flap down there, is the the skin is pretty thick on the heel. Like you're not going to get that type of skin down there. But I mean, if there's a if there's an option for soft tissue coverage and you know ORIF, you can offer that to the patient. But let them let the patient know that there may be like multiple surgeries. There could be continued pain with a reconstructive <clears throat> path. So let me keep it simple. Let me ask the panel, just a show of hands, who wants to save the leg? Who wants to amputate? Mm -hmm. I, I think you guys didn't vote. Yeah, I'm, I, I, Wait, wait, who wants to save the leg? Dr. Haydell and Shaw, wanna, you wanna, wanna save it? I wanna save the leg. Dr. Bossy wants to amputate. All right, so <laughs> Dr. Bossy, why amputate? Well, I, I think that um, the long-term outcomes on this patient, uh, this is a complex injury to the terminal portion of the limb. Uh, where every time they put the foot on the ground, it's going to, you can bypass a tibia problem. You know, you can splint it, you can volumetric muscle loss, you can brace them, you can do whatever you need to do, you can fuse the ankle joint. Uh, once you get to the foot area, it's, you know, every step you take, uh, you're stepping on something that's going to be hurt and deformed. Um, a flap's going to be, uh, it won't resist sheer, uh, sheer stress and will be insensate in most cases and is likely going to break down and won't fit in the shoe. Skin grafting is going to be friable and, and break down. Uh, and I think the patient's gonna have a miserable outcome. This is one of the areas where I think shared decision-making breaks down. Because if you tell the patient, well, you know, I, 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 if it's a mid-tibia mid fracture like before, I'm gonna say, hey, I, I, can, I, I can limb salvage, I can do amputation, I have the skill set for either one, you have to tell me what you want. On this one, you can save this, you can save most any foot. But I think if you give that option to the patient and don't really paint the bleak picture, you can talk them into a procedure they don't want or need. This patient will be back to work in four months with an amputation. Without an amputation, there's unlikely, unless they're a white collar worker, they're gonna go back to work again. So I would amputate this and I wouldn't tell the patient that limb salvage was an option. Okay, you know, I, I, did, I, I just wanna just make this clear. Unfortunately, this is not a, a simple <laughs> situation. Like, it, it's very, I think it's, I think it's very difficult to like, to say we're gonna cut your leg off. I, I remember this patient, we had a lot of detailed conversations with him about reconstruction versus uh, amputation and, and he chose this. He actually, this, this case came in in the middle of this meeting, whatever it was, five years ago or something like that. I, I distinctly remember getting a phone call <laughs> like during the day on, a fri on the Friday of the meeting. We got this going on here. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think this is, I would agree with both of you. I think this is a tough situation. Um, this guy distinctly, I remember one day on rounds, this guy basically at some point drawing a line and saying like, just cut it off. Yeah, and yeah. I don't get that from a lot of patients. Now, Dr. Haydell probably a lot of talks with them too. I had some talks with them. He probably, <clears throat> maybe Dr. Bossy called them and said like, tell those guys to cut your leg off. Yeah. But um, he was very firm about it. And this is the problem. I don't find myself in that situation a lot of times. As I think, if I'm interpreting Dr. Bossy correctly, you kind of have to direct the patient a little bit because I think otherwise, 
If you really think an amputation is the right thing, but you just keep giving patients options, most patients are not going to choose an amputation because you just kind of decide to just, you know, it's a drastic decision to make, and you just decide to keep going along the road. You figure you can always do an amputation. In my mind, I think that, and we haven't had to do this a lot, but I think that if you're going to make the decision, you don't necessarily have to do it on the first day. If it's a 3C open tibia, maybe you make the decision right then and on the hospital day zero. But I think in a case like this, this isn't something that you want to amputate at three months or six months. I think that if you can you know, see how it plays out, really have an honest discussion, hopefully have a patient that can understand, and you have to direct them, I think, a little bit. Uh, we were fortunate because he was very resolute in his decision and made this, uh, made up his mind. But I think, I think if you can get this done during that hospitalization, I think it's a better expectation. So, so I'm just going to ask everybody to remember this case for the talk that I'm going to give in, a, uh, in about a half hour, because this is the case we're talking about when we talk about the limb salvage, you know, amputation and, and what's the good result. Um, if, you know, unfortunately, the LEAP study said that if you amputate or limb salvage, the results are about the same, so do what the patient wants to do. But we, we, mis we misstated the results. That patient was never in the LEAP study in the salvage group, because the guys back in those days, we cut them all off. We didn't give them the option. And then, unfortunately, the study comes out and says, well, geez, of those that we amputated, they did as well as the reconstructions. But we didn't qualify enough by saying that good doctors make good decisions looking at long-term outcomes and said, eh, that's not going to do well. That needs, to, that needs to go away. So um, anyhow, I actually saw this guy a couple weeks ago. I see him periodically. Um, I, I kind of inject uh, both his knees. He actually doesn't have a lot of radiographic. <laughs> actually, doesn't have a lot of radiographic arthritis, but I think this knee probably has some arthritis, and his other knee, you know, probably takes a lot of load. But he's been on a prosthetic for a long time, um, and you know, the prosthetics do need, you know, they. It's not like these patients go away. I mean, they, he comes in and he does potentially need a new prescription for something uh, with the with the prosthetic. So I think some of the take home points, I think, are is try to make a decision relatively early, not like on the first day when they have no idea what's going on. Um, but once you kind of see how things are playing out, you have enough input. And I think uh, a mangled, insensate foot with no skin care, I think is kind of a deal breaker, um, right? Or you guys can disagree. No, I agree. Deal breaker. Case three. Uh, this is Dr. Boss's I'll case. give you the history on this one. So right, this is the 52-year-old so. guy from North Carolina where racing is, is, uh, is uh, you know, if you're, not, if, if you're not rubbing, you're not racing, I guess, as they say. And uh, he, he, instead of turning, um, you know, left around the track, he, he turned right a little bit and hit the wall and, and had his, this injury. He's an amateur race car driver. So we can have the next slide with the, picture, the, the uh, soft tissue. So he comes in with this kind of, uh, you know, massive injury, a segmental tibia fracture, a very proximal tibia, a distal metatarsal fracture, and the tibia in between pretty much, you know, divided or stripped of a lot of the muscle. The periosteum is still on, but there is a tenuous muscle group to that. Uh, the initial wound was a little smaller than that, but it was horribly contaminated, so we had to extend it to expose the entire zone of injury, um, and this is the the injury that we have at this point in time. So the question is, you know, how do you want to take care of this uh, the first evening? Panelists? Uh, I think the goals <clears throat> on that first debridement are just to clean the wound up, get rid of all the gross contamination, do a thorough debridement. Um, if, there, if, you're, if you're concerned about that segmental a uh, piece of bone, maybe leaving it at this time, stabilizing the leg with some sort of external fixation, and then bringing them back in about 24 to 48 hours to see if that injury is demarcated or that segmental piece of bone is viable. So, Dr. Shaw, when you got to, let's say that that skin looks like it comes all the way over. Um, are you automatically bringing that patient back for a second look? I think a lot of it you have to depend on. You can approximate on. the skin. Yeah, yeah I, I think even if you can't approximate the I think a lot of it depends on how much gross contamination you had in the first place. Okay. So you may do a second look for concern about missed contamination. I would say and I would also be concerned about marginal tissues, muscle, that maybe you didn't quite get the first time. Yeah, absolutely. 
So, so all that happened. So the first night we could actually close the tissue, but it was all degloved and expected at some point in time that the wound uh, would break down. And he was scheduled for uh, De Breedmont. We put this uh, traveling traction frame on him, and you'll see an X-ray in the future. Uh, can you have the next? This? And and since we had the opportunity, we used you know we wanted to protect that middle segment and the soft tissue that was attached to it. And these wounds are wide open, so from the small fragments that we just put, uh, you know, three five plates with unicortical screws, you know, that knowing that we could come back and take those that plate off to recreate our injury. Uh, and at some point in time, maybe even use those plates if we're going to nail this, if it survives, to, uh, to help, you know, keep the alignment. Um, the patient did, as was suggested, each time he came back to the OR, and he came back about three times over the next five days, he had additional uh, necrosis of uh, muscle that was removed. We did maintain the muscle to that intercalary bone uh, defect. And then we finally were able to drop a nail down it, keeping the proximal plate and could remove the distal plate and help keep the alignment. That's what the skin looked like at the end, but it was a big defect. And then we had to get our plastic guys involved to put a plastic or fla flap on it at about the seven day point. And uh, he got out of the hospital and is uh, recovering well. He's about four weeks out now. So this is the kind of case uh, one of our plastics docs, uh, if they're worried about the skin dying, might do one of these spy angiograms, which is a really cool thing that helps them identify it's, uh, it's like a skin angiogram to help identify like if the flap is at risk or how well perfused a flap is. You just brought, it kind of brought that to mind. Actually, at the, in the final debris mount, with, before they put the flap on, our plastic surgeon does the same thing to make sure that he leaves no dead tissue in the surrounding skin. Oh, okay. So they, 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 they made the hole I had even bigger because they didn't want, they wanted to size their flap appropriately, so. Yeah, I think this spy tool um, has some definite uses. Again, it's a way to help, it's like, they think they can all help do it to look at bone perfusion as well. I mean, they're talking about using it for sternal, uh, you know, when they get involved in sternal cases, for instance, uh, to identify, help identify uh, dead bone that may not be readily uh, visible. Well, um, we're running over. I'm going to stop here. Uh, we're already uh, almost two minutes over. Dr. Haydell uh, had a great case in here, so I'm sorry I, I uh, don't have uh, the time to get through it because I want to keep the program moving. So very challenging case that had to be treated with um, uh, spacer, antibiotics, and uh, I thought we were going to have time to get through it, but you know how it is. It's, it always takes longer uh, than you think. So those are the course, uh, the, the session objectives. I want to thank Dr. Bossy, uh, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Haydell uh, for their expertise and um, 